Yes, I'm an alien here. I don't know anything about neuroscience. I know a lot about data. Uh, there are no monkeys in this talk. And, um, and you can tell that I'm from a different community because the collection of stickers on my laptop is completely different to the collection of stickers on everybody else's laptop. So uh, that's a sure sign that I'm from somewhere else. OK, so I'm going to talk about FAIR. Now, I know it's after lunch, and it's all about data, and, uh, and there are no groovy pictures of brains. But let's try to uh, at least get some enthusiasm. So FAIR, as uh, Marianne, who actually gave uh, practically all my talk this morning in her opening, who is also an author of the FAIR Principles paper, which is done our H indexes, no harm at all, Marianne. Um, it, it stands, I already told us it stands for findable, accessible, um, interoperable, and reusable. And what I'm going to do is later on go and dig into that a little bit more. Uh, but that's the basis of um, what we mean by FAIR. And there's some hidden terms as well. If you can find it, you can probably cite it. If you can access it, you can probably track it. If you can interoperate it, you might even understand what it's about. And reusable um, pairs up with reproducible, but they are not the same. But that's another talk altogether. But the other part of my uh, talk was about uh, research commons. And uh, what is a research commons? So uh, it's a shared space a shared space where investigators store and share and access and uh, connect and interact with digital objects. And I say digital objects here, not data, because workflows, models, all sorts of other things are also uh, a research commons uh, commodity. Um, it's not a database and it's not a warehouse. It's a way of being able to organize within a community. So it's a way for organizing your digital objects in a community in different databases, in different repositories, in different registries. Typically, and this is a picture uh, from Bob Grossman's idea of what a uh, cancer uh, commons would be, you have tools for putting things in, you have tools for doing analysis, and then you have a small collection of services that try to link a zoo of repositories and a zoo of registries. And it's important that what we're dealing with in our fair commonses are zoos, not monocult monocultures. We're not trying to build one database. Um, and in particular, I wanted to emphasize the fact that this is an ecosystem, which I probably already said, of pooled resources, with a, which is a federation with many entry points. So it's not one portal. And I say this in case any of you are from the European Commission. Anybody from the European Commission? No. Hooray! No. Um, uh, <laughs> Because uh, the European Open Science Cloud, which of course isn't European, isn't open, isn't about science and isn't a cloud, but apart from that is perfectly named, is actually a research commons. And there's always this attempt to put a single entry point, one web page onto all data for Europe. This is just bonkers. So uh, it's not, not the way a, a commons actually works. It's also collectively created, owned, and shared by the whole community with mixed degrees of control. And I wanted to uh, highlight that a little bit. So this is uh, a picture from the uh, Research Commons in order to be able to do cancer research, which was funded at the NIH. And this was an attempt to actually kind of quite control how this would be managed by uh, be organizing uh, a few key data sets and organizing a community in order to be able to really work on very well-defined standards. Um, you're all building research commons, so I found a couple of uh, examples. You know, the Human Brain Project, that's building a research commons. The um, Open Science Brain Community, that's building a research commons. I think the next two days, we're going to hear a numerous number of people uh, building research commons. The one I'm associated with is called Elixir. And Elixir is an equivalent to uh, INCF in some ways for life science data in Europe. It's uh, 23 uh, nodes uh, from uh, European countries, uh, 15 different communities that it recognizes it particularly supports, but it supports all life science data. So it's particularly how do we organize and manage life science data for all life science problems and projects. It's trying to coordinate a, a zoo of community uh, resources 
so you know you all use uh, Array Express and um, ENA and all these kinds of other things, all of those, and all, as well as all the national data sets. And to try to marshal all the different tools of the community, compute resources, and so on. It's massively distributed. It's 220 different institutes in Europe. Um, each one of these has its own APIs, its own funding, its own web interfaces, its own submission tools, its own tool deployment, and it's held together with common identifiers, registries, workflows, love, hope, um, and uh, an awful lot of politics and drinking. So this is how we actually put this together. And because that's easy, we're now doing the European Open Science Cloud Life Project, which is to build an Uber Fair Life Science Commons, which attempts to federate 13 research infrastructures, of which Elixir is one. Uh, for, so, for example, BBMRI, which is to do with um, uh, biobanking, MIRRI, which is to do with marine. I mean, all these... Uh, so this is, this is clearly uh, a challenge. So what we're dealing here is a zoo of catalogues, a zoo of tools, a zoo of data, a zoo of, uh, of workflows, uh, a zoo of computing resources. So my first fairy story is to pick up on something that uh, Marianne said which is there's a temptation, if we're talking about FAIR, to jump right in and talk about interoperability and to talk about uh, doing really complicated things with standards. But the first thing you must do before you can link something is find it. So how would we, when we're working in such a complicated commons, where we have such a range of every kind of life science data, imaging data and omics data, and model data and synthetic biology data and so on, what do we do there? Because there is no one model. So we looked at how do we do simple finding. So our first fair story is, conventions, lightweight conventions, for just find, finding and accessing and registering data sets, where you have existing data models and existing interfaces. And we have two things here that uh, we're working with particularly, one called EDMI, which is the European Open Science Cloud Dataset Minimum Information, which is, uh, does exactly what it says in the tin. It's a, a minimum information in order to be able to uh, describe for each of the resources what that resource actually does in order to be able to drive underlying infrastructure. I'm not going to talk about that one. I'm going to talk about bioschemas. So bioschemas is conventions for using schema.org to uh, find, access, and index data sets and other objects. In particular, to make them ready... Uh, it, well, not particular, but it also incidentally makes them ready for Google data set search as well. It's very small, very lightweight, it's very viral, and it follows the model of a little bit of semantics everywhere. Who's heard of schema.org? Yay, right, good. So I don't have to explain this slide. Uh, for, the, well, the, for the handful of you who didn't, it's structured data descriptors in web pages. Uh, very low barrier, uh, universal markup, so it's a little bit of embedded markup in uh, a web page. But the key thing is it's a little bit, um, so that you can expose what's in that web page or that data set or whatever it is you're trying to expose, such that you can then exchange information about it, you can extract it from your, uh, for your um, registries, you can do automated curation with it, so fair sharing, which was also mentioned by Marianne as a um, registry of standards, fair standards, that's managed by, uh, or, or part of its, um, it's part of the Elixir family, that uses uh, this kind of, of mechanism. So it follows the Goldilocks principle, which is not too hot and not too cold, just enough. And Goldilocks is the uh, principle that we're trying to follow throughout all of our activities in uh, our Elixir co uh, Fair Commons, which is the temptation to over-engineer everything is strong, and we have to constantly hold back, and I'll mention that a little bit later on. So what we've uh, managed to do over the last two or three years, it takes a long time, is we take uh, the schema.org, uh, uh, now consider data set, for example. In schema.org, there are 91 properties for data set. We probably don't need 91 properties. In fact, we needed five. 
So we chose five with eight optional ones, but really just five that we were interested in if you wanted to describe a data set. Basic information like who owns it and uh, when was it released. Boring stuff like that. The tools could then use when they were automatically processing over it. So we um, have generic um, specifications. We have some to do with scientific activities, like what is it, marking up workflows, marking up uh, lab protocols. And then we have things to do with biodata. So the few, the six or seven things we want to say if it's about a protein or it's about a sample. We then um, embed that into our resources and then it can be picked up by aggregators and registries and search engines like Google and uh, various different applications. So it's taken up to, up to now 200 people have participated in that activity. 68 resources are marked up so far. We have about 11 million pages. We have seven candidate new types. Uh, like sample, going to uh, the schema.org community where they will become part of the regular schema.org activities. And we have uh, 30 profiles, which are conventions for using uh, current schema.org. 14 countries have participated in that. And a little example of this is, uh, this is from Marine, our Marine partners, and they have a Marine archive. Um, which they have no API. They've got no ability to do an API. It's a very small um, activity. They um, mark up their web pages in Bioschema. Um, we have a little search, a little harvester that goes and crawls and picks it up. And then in, in Biosamples, which will, then, when it wants to register this data, extracts that information, registers it into the Biosamples curation, and links back to it. So you keep the provenance of where these things came from. So this is an example of very lightweight FAIR in a FAIR Commons. So it was a happy ending. It's endorsed by Elixir. Uh, our first types are going into schema.org. And, uh, and as I said, this Goldilocks principle was very important um, because, believe me, the amounts of debates on uh, trying to explode into ontology land so ontologists are great people. Some of my best friends are ontologists. <laughs> However, they could argue about the semantics on the head of angels and pins till, the, till one loses the will to live. And particularly as an engineer, because I'm actually an engineer, we lose the ability to do anything with it. And so this is a very engineering process. So it, it was important that it remained tractable to software engineers. So when it all got a bit too ontology, we went back and said, no, unless it's a very simple thing that somebody can immediately put up that just understands how to scrape a bit of JSON, forget it. Um, so that's the difference between elegance and the best for tools. And of course, we have trolls because everybody thinks we're reinventing ontologies. Um, this only uses a subset of the FAIR principles. So then I want to go into a little bit about the FAIR principles, or quite a lot about the FAIR principles, actually, having spent some time writing them with Marianne. Uh, and the FAIR principles versus FAIR the nice intention, because they are quite different things. So um, our second story is that once upon a time, um, in a uh, meeting in Lorentz, which is uh, in the Netherlands, uh, there was a gathering together of 40 people and a woman. So there's issues there. Let's, uh, I, had to, I had to nip out for a, a day, and uh, so that was the, the last female left. Those of you who watched Ice Age, you'll get that joke with your children. Um, so anyway, um, we produced this, uh, this paper called... Uh, the Fair Guiding Principles. But there have been many, many efforts before. It was a grassroots activity that's actually become a bit of a top-down one. Here are the principles, which I took off the website. So I, you know, due diligence, I did uh, go onto the ICF website, although I'm now told that it's all changing anyway. But anyway, um, this is the Fair Principles. There will be a short test afterwards. They are actually in the paper only in a breakout box. They are never explained. Okay, so uh, that's actually proved to be good because we can get away with anything and bad because we can get away with anything. 
Um, so, uh, and some of them, we're not quite sure what they even mean. Uh, metadata include reference references to other, met qualify references to other metadata. People puzzle about what the semantics of that actually mean. So the, what they're intended to mean is that data and metadata are locatable and accessible uh, by identifiers. Um, and they're standard access protocols uh, to access them, and they have the least restrictive licenses that you can get away with. And the second piece is that they're machine and human-readable re human data formats and, meta -form and metadata formats that is compliant to many community standards, not just one community standards, because you might have, uh, uh, if you have a, a uh, data set, you might want to be able to mark that up with respect to a data, uh, a standard to do with registering that data set, which comes from the library community, as opposed to a, a, uh, marking up with a, uh, a community standard, which comes from the domain, like you know, proteomics. So there's multiple data sets. It persists, that metadata persists, and it tells you the provenance of the data and, uh, and how it's costing to other data. So that was the intention. So they're more than a fuzzy feeling. And in fact, on your own website, you say it's enhancing the ability of machines to automatically find and use data or any digital object that supports its reuse by individuals. So it's all to do with access automation. So that was the purpose, but it's also got into policy and proclamation and vision because it has this cool word called FAIR. So the, the message has spread across the lands. Uh, there's numerous papers about the cost about not having FAIR and what does FAIR mean in practice and, and uh, the uh, whole grant pro programs called the verification of data sets and things like this. Uh, there's uh, FAIR uh, hackathons at BioIT World. There's a whole bunch of projects with the word FAIR written into them, just to be on the safe side, um, and uh, including one of mine. Uh, I'm not stupid. And uh, uh, a whole bunch of... These are all projects I'm funded on, actually. But, and all these different organisations claiming that they run the whole meaning of FAIR. So lots of going on. So this tells me something, that simple words are powerful things that can be mangled, and simple concepts are not so simple to implement. So let's going to have a little bit of a look at what we mean by fair. One size does not fit all. And do beware, if you remember one thing out of this talk, beware of fair zealots, because there are lots of people out there who are claiming that they will solve your uh, fair problems. Uh, because they have always been fair, whatever that was, um, use their te technology because it's the only way that you can possibly be fair, uh, that they claim to be the only people that control fair, and they don't know what it means, but they're going to measure it anyway. And that's one of the things I'm going to talk about next, because that's very, very worrying. So even Baron Mons, who is our kind of... Uh, uh, he came up with the word... Um, wrote in his paper, uh, which immediately followed, uh, there are emerging indications uh, that this word may be sometimes stretched, uh, which will raise concerns and confusions. And in fact, um, he's just produced or led the activity of another paper, which is interpretations and implementation considerations, which was still equally as contentious. So let's get out to some reality. So because this morning, FAIR came up at least four times that I counted in different talks. The principles are actually an aspiration. They're a journey. They are a call for this machine actionability. They're very ambiguous. Uh, it's a spectrum. What's, you know, you can have uh, different degrees of fairness, which I'll briefly say. They have to be domain respectful. They have to be implementable with today's protocols. So that's something else that people are trying to invent the notion of a fair protocol. There's no need, just regular protocol. It's more to do with how you use those protocols, not the invention of a new one. It's just a subset of what we mean by good indicators for a good data set. And they are very much a work in progress. They are not a standard. Um, they're not strict. Um, they are not about one size fits all. They've got nothing to do with quality. Um, they are not open. 
It's nothing to do with open either. They are not tablets of stone. So they're not about being open. You can be fair, not open. Otherwise, it'd be four, because A stands for access, not open. And they're not about uh, privacy pre uh, preserving or, or um, regulatory rigor either. I'll mention that a bit later on as well. They're not about a resource's quality or impact. So, for example, in Elixir, we help choose which resources we're really going to put our energies behind supporting. We call them the core data resources. And uh, amongst a whole measure of indicators are, are they fair? So they, do they adhere to these principles? But there are many other <coughs> indicators, like what is the quality of the data? Is it a good database? Does the community care about it? You can have a fair data set which is perfect. All the metadata's there, it's readable, it has all the APIs, it has all identifiers, and nobody cares a damn about it, right? Because it's irrelevant, it's out of date, it's not supported by the community. And you can have another data set which is absolutely critical and doesn't meet all the fair measures, but that's okay, right? Because it's an aspiration of where to move on to. And it's actually not about harmonizing all metadata to one schema either. So there's a bit of hype, and we're about here at the moment, about to descend into the trough of dis disillusionment, um, because we need to do a bit more of this clarity uh, business. And in particular, we need to do more on cost-benefit analysis, because it is quite expensive to make an existing data set fair. And so you need to be very careful about what, how you choose your battles and what you're actually going to do. So this uh, European report actually is very good. I do recommend, I know most European reports aren't, but this one's all right. Uh, turning fair into reality. And it sets out a roadmap, which I've summarized here uh, so that you can actually read it. So which is first define it, good point, then implement it, and then embed it and sustain it. So this is a journey that we're currently on at the moment. And you'll notice some things, the building a culture, building some skills, building incentives are actually critical. So when I looked at the, uh, your current website, um, this is what you said about uh, INCF supports FAIR and its adherence to them is a requirement for the standards. And you have this document, which is about uh, review criteria for the standards of best practices. So you've got quite a lot of things to do with the standards of best practices, but nothing about, in the, on the website, I'm looking at Marianne here, about the actual resources themselves. Yeah, I'm, I thought you would. So let's go into um, what do we mean by how would we then, how would INCF an account and be able to say, your data set is fair. Okay, not your standard, but your data set, or your registry, or whatever it is you want to be able to do. So that means being clear, having clear metrics and models, uh, and maturity models, and you need to have some sort of assessment, and then you have to have some sort of verification methodology. And verification is a word, by the way. I haven't made that up. Um, well, I have made it up, but, you know, it's a word. Uh, um, and when do, you, when do you do FAIR? Do you do it when you create the data? Do you do it when you want to store the data somewhere else in a public uh, archive, for example, one of the splendid databases that was presented earlier? Or, for, or, or what do you do with all the legacy? So here, the thing to worry about is that uh, FAIR is actually on its three steps. It's a contract at first, so it's all about uh, you know, setting up expectations, as I've already said, so that you can do some self-evaluation and do some reporting. There's a step which is to do with compliance, when you want to be able to comply to um, what, what you consider within your community to be judged to what you consider to be fair. Uh, and that's in order to be able to review and to do comparisons and to do monitoring. And then there's this third step, which is judgment and regulation by whom, and I presume, as from Marianne said this morning, INCF has a view to do this for some of their resources. Um, the reason 
I put that up is because it, it's, it's amazing. As soon as you put out a paper, immediately people say, right, we're going to measure it. We've got to, you know, because the commission wants to know, are you fair or are you not? So because then we can decide what we're not going to fund anymore because you don't follow, you don't get a tick. So a whole bunch of people, including the NIH, came up with the idea of how do we do this assessment and we're going to have stars and scores and things like this. And this is a nightmare because you've got something that's ambiguous, that is domain specific, uh, that uh, really needs to be worked out in the community. And then you're going to have some folks who you've never heard of declare that your data set isn't fair. Okay, that's not a good thing to do. So these, uh, this was a very unhappy ending from, this community, from, from these efforts. Subjective, hard to interpret, judgmental, when the intention was not to be judgmental. The intention was to be supportive, to be able to change how we did things, you know, not to measure things. Uh, there tended to be drifts to quality reviews, uh, occasionally just barking mad. Things came up with, you know, um, you know, this resource clearly isn't fair. Oh, okay, so well, shall we just tell the EBI they should close their data set down? I don't think so. And you know what? They didn't. Anyway, so this is partly because of uh, Dunkelseifer. Dunkelseifer is the splendid German word that says dark figures. It is the things that you cannot see that matter. And uh, so not everything that count can be counted counts. And not everything that counts can be counted. So that's why this kind of uh, evaluation has to be done very uh, sympathetically. Uh, because FAIR is non-trivial um, at anything other than most sufficial, uh, superficial level. And that's from, from Mark, who is our lead author. So when you INCF go about defining their uh, FAIR assessments, they will need to do uh, some very... That, this is going to be a big piece of work. This is going to be tough because you've got to pick up indicators, you've got to divide your transparent evaluation, and then you've got to eat your own dog food, which means design, build, test, and learn those indicators at the same time as you do the evaluations. So all together, uh, not to do them separate. And you're going to have to take indicators that are robust, have humility, are transparent, diverse and reflexive, and there's this brilliant uh, paper called The Metric Tide that describes all about metrics and measures, as well as um, putting it into context, particularly what's the cost benefit. Uh, and so now there's a whole bunch of activities uh, throughout, uh, well, not just throughout Europe, but elsewhere, figuring out what does a maturity model look like? So maturity models are where you have different levels like a, a sort of value-based assessment. So this is a sort of maturi naive maturity model uh, that says the different stages at different points that you could be at in your fair assessment. Um, and there's a lot of work being done in different projects uh, in order to be able to identify what are the indicators that indicate that you might be meeting a fair principle and what is the, uh, what is the process and, and how do you choose what the different levels of those indicators should be? So this is a, a process or capability model that's being developed from the FAIR Plus project, which is to do with verifying drug databases. Uh, and this is from the Research Data Alliance, FAIR Data Maturity Model Working Group, which was set up in part to be able to deal with a, quite a lot of these different challenges. Um, and uh, its next meeting is on the 12th of September, um, and it has various different sessions at the Helsinki uh, Research Data Alliance uh, plenary at the moment. It's, uh, for those of you, who, who's been participating in this? Can I urge you to participate? Uh, this was actually, although it's through Research Data Alliance, it's actually a PricewaterhouseCooper contract for the European Commission which means that whatever they come up with is how your grant's going to be judged. So you want to be in there, man, uh, because uh, I think this is actually very important. And it's, I, in my opinion, 
it needs a little bit of re-steering. I'm being videoed, aren't I? It needs a little bit of uh, nudging, shall we say. So here's an in easy indicator. Um, metadata are released with a clear, accessible um, data usage license. So data or metadata are, are released like this. So you can say, OK, what's the property of license? What's the format? And what does it allow you to do? And the difference, so this is your maturity level. And this is what you're actually measuring. Now, this is currently what? Uh, that was an early attempt. This is a new attempt. Uh, it's mandatory that metadata includes information about the license under which the data can be reused. Well, OK. Um, it's, uh, it's OK, I guess. Um, it's, it's kind of less clear. It's not less precise. Um, but, uh, but this is the kind of thing that will become um, part of the uh, judgment of all resources. This one's a trickier indicator. It meets the domain relevant community standard. And uh, this is trickier because all it does is it just says uh, you will meet the domain community standard. It's not very um, helpful to measure. And suppose there isn't a standard. Suppose, or supposing the standard isn't up to it. Um, so they have to be community specific. Which standard? How is it going to be validated? How are you going to capture it? Um, so things like the neuro shapes, um, metadata, your portal, your reviewers, this is the sort of thing they're really going to have to, to uh, work on. Because basically, it's quite easy to do some of the F and the A. You can do them in a kind of non-domain specific way. But as soon as you get into the interoperability and reuse, you're into, it's up to you guys to come up with it. And there has been an effort to build an automated uh, system in order to be able to devise and create maturity indicators, to register them as collections um, in fair sharing, to then write tests for them, um, so that if you have a starting URI, you apply those tests, and then you report. And that infrastructure is called the FAIR Evaluator. And there are companies already starting to start this up as a business. Okay? Um, so at least it has community-governed indicators, so you can decide your own. The idea is to completely automate FAIR detection. Um, and at least they are trying to sanity check it while it's uh, being, being developed. Of course, this doesn't do anything to do with that one I just mentioned because it's impossible. But it will do things like, have you got a license? Uh, does it resolve? Is there metadata there? And um, the thing that we've, dis well, Mark's been doing this for some time now, is that most things that say they're fair aren't. And then there's this uh, effort to do with verification of legacy databases, the new uh, magic word, which is uh, um, how, what is the process and the methodology in order to be able to take legacy databases and make it so that their identifiers are persistent and make it so that their metadata is, is fair and so on, without getting all muddled up with harmonization pipelines. It's non-trivial. And this is, again, turning into a business. So people are turning this into, into a business. So the conclusion of this part is just saying you are fair doesn't make it true. OK? Is it uneven? Some parts of fair are easy. Some, people aren't, some parts of it aren't. And it's multifaceted. Identifier use is chaotic. So that automated system that uh, Mark Wilkinson has produced, where you produce uh, you know, what you think you should be measuring and how, um, and then really put it through this uh, automated process, um, has really identified that identifier use is terrible, actually. Um, and separating out what is metadata from data is really hard, okay? and yet it's part of this. It's a non-trivial. It's a set of behaviors, not a specific technology. And also that we really need to be investing in first mile fare. That means we can't be doing this as a legacy effort. We can't be saying, oh, we're going to try and just fix it at the end. 
We can't try to fix it when we're putting the data into a public uh, community archive or, or shared repository. We have to actually do it at the beginning. So for that is my third story. And my third story is first mile. First mile, last mile, same thing. This is how far away are you from the actual end goal of, uh, of where you're going to deposit your data? So I, I built a, I built a system for, for years now, for a decade now, uh, which is a commons for self-managing systems biology projects. So this is uh, systems biology projects where there are no curators, they're doing it themselves. Um, they're managing data and models and standard operating procedures and workflows and samples. Um, and what we want to do is to bridge from the infrastructure and the standard and uh, the, the databases that are in the community to the actual investigator. And uh, it's been quite widely used and the uh, infrastructure is very widely used. So the key point here is what this tries to do is say, one of the problems that we have is you're doing lots of different uh, types of, of work in systems biology, and then you have put it into all these different repositories for different types. And you completely lose the context. So, and then you have to rebuild it all again. Because there's a really good database for proteins, which is prote a you know, proteomic database for pride, and there's the biomodels for the models, and there's another models one, and so on. So instead, what you, want to be, well, what you want to be able to do is to say, we respect the existence of all of this, but we want to be able to create a way of interlinking all of the different types of data and to enable them to still be in their own repositories, to still be there. So this is references between uh, metadata, including uh, the repositories that may be at your own institution, because that's where your data is stored. So this is a commons that attempts to effectively bridge across the ecosystem. It bridges across the ecosystem of your local environment, so your local, uh, your local lab, your local university, but also the public databases where your data will be eventually deposited into or that you want to be able to refer to when you're trying to organize your metadata. And, it's, and it tries to also link things like your protocols with your data and your models and so on. And it does it by using this thing called ISA, which is the Investigation Studies Assay uh, Model. So that's, and this is a little bit that you can briefly see a little bit there. So it's how do I relate metadata together? So why is that important? Because what we want to do is when you're starting your project and you're looking after your data like this, that you will then be able to put it up to a repository because it's already organized, it's already prepared, it's already got a pathway, okay? So it's a part of a staging post to these other resources. Because when you're in your ecosystem, when you're in your uh, commons, what we frequently think about is this world, all the different public data sets and how they all work together. But nobody works in that world, they all work in their labs. And their labs is using, you know, normal, their normal environments. Or they're working with their national infrastructures, their national store, their national galaxy installation. So a commons has to incorporate all of these things. So, so uh, part of the challenge for INCF is how do I go from the, uh, the data actually being collected and managed by the researchers in the field such that it's ready to go into the public archives in its format? Because here, a miracle occurs quite a lot of the time. We're good, and also, that miracle is, is uh, two different kind of... Um, uh, agendas here. So ISCF has the agenda of wanting really good, long-term, high-quality data collections. And these researchers want to get a nature paper out really fast. That's completely different. And sloppy science wins. So that's, that's going to be a challenge. And here's the picture. So that's exactly what Marianne said. So I just had a different picture, but that's what she was saying. So the, the, the end of this, this part, this story is, there's a tragedy. There's a tragedy of the fair commons. It's only as fair as its tenants 
So it's only fair as, as, as they, they uh, support uh, and allow it and, and contribute to it. Project sovereignty rules. So I've been running this, uh, this thing called Fairdom for a long time, so I've got a hell of a lot of data about how people actually share in projects, and the answer is they don't. There we are. Um, because of all the reasons that we all know. Um, professional stewardship into projects is essential because it's the only real way to just having a PhD student read up about a bit of, uh, of how to do a bit of uh, data management isn't enough. And there has to be significant community socialization and values, by which I mean primary investigators because the villain of the piece is primary investigators. Uh, because PhD students, in my experience, very keen on uh, being able to do the right thing. Primary investigators are very keen on them writing a nature paper. And uh, it costs, it costs money. I have some very great primary investigators who have done this well and have benefited, but many uh, are kind of, fact, they don't see it's important to do good data management. And, and this, is a, this might be a useful uh, little um, uh, roadmap for you when you're doing INCF. I mentioned nudging here because there are four incentives in the world in commons production. Love, money, fame, and nudge. That's the only four things you can do uh, in order to be able to persuade people to behave well in a commons environment. Uh, and PhD students do it for love. Uh, everybody else does it for grants and for papers. But the way to really make a difference is to do it by stealth, by sneaking it into processes, by smuggling in a very good quality metadata collection into your spreadsheets. Things like this. This is how you really manage it. And my last um, story is about fair digital objects. So in, in the Turning Fair into Reality paper, um, it talks about digital objects, not just data. Um, so that means everything has an identifier, there's formats, there's metadata, and there's this object. And in particular, in the European Open Science Cloud Life project, we are building workflow commons. And I know that you're really into workflows, because uh, JB told me. Um, in, uh, in neurosciences. And I've run for the last uh, 15 years, I think, uh, a workflow commons, uh, the, the first general and still the only general workflow uh, registry. But there is a zoo, again, of workflow registries for all the different kinds of systems, including GitHub itself. How many workflow systems are currently available for science? We keep a list. Any guesses? 50, 50, no, 15, no, not 1,500, that's a good guess though. 255, we know of 255 that are real, as opposed to there was a paper, like they have to actually have some code, uh, things like that. So 255 and counting. So the point of FAIR was that uh, to make metadata and data so it's machine actionable so that you could actually use it in things like workflows. And even better, if that fair data could then be generated from the workflows, because then it would be automated and it would be good fair data. Um, and that means all the workflows have to operate in fair and not proprietary formats. So that's your software has to produce fair and not proprietary formats. It also means that you have to pro propagate identifiers and licenses and authorization through your workflows, which is non-trivial. It also means you have to mint identifiers and track provenance and know how to license the end product as well when you, that end product is actually the, the combination of many other data items, all with different licenses and with codes that may also all have different licenses. So that's quite interesting. Um, and uh, here's a little picture of uh, an entry of a kind of a view on our, our forthcoming workflow uh, commons. We can treat 
fair workflows, fair workflows themselves, uh, if they're like software, then the principles don't work anymore because they're composite. They have portability issues. There's lots of versioning. I mean, it's, it, it was designed, the fair principles were really designed for data. They weren't designed for highly composite, executable, changeable objects, right? And, and in fact, they, things like software maturity and maintainability and documentation practices are really important. But we can also treat workflows as if they were data. And if we treat them like they were data, then we can give them machine actionable metadata. And luckily, we have some. The common workflow language is a way of describing workflows to be portable and scalable and interoperable for the different systems and so that they could be used for containerized tools. And we also use things like uh, EDAM ontology to mock up the inputs and outputs and the different steps. And we are, we're using something called the research object uh, specification to bundle together the descriptions of all of the different components of the workflow, to add some context, to relate the different components to other collections like the standard operating procedure it might be associated with or lab protocols and also to link these descriptions with their native workflow systems. And this is going to be the basis of the European Open Science Cloud Life Workflow uh, Collaboratory. It's also the basis of something called the Biocompute Object Specification. And this is uh, an IEEE specification that uh, is currently going through standardization, which is to do with how do I describe a high throughput sequencing uh, pipeline such that it can go through regulation as, an, as a medical instrument, as a tool. Okay? So that means I really have to describe it so it's safe, which means I really have to describe the parameters properly for once, uh, because that matters. And, and so this is all part of that activity. So this is part of the standards work that Marianne mentioned that is going on somewhere else. That, that maybe INCF will be interested in. So to finish up, how's that going? How's this workflow stuff going? Well, it's work in progress. Again, the issue here is to keep everything developer friendly. Nobody reads specs, <coughs> nobody. Everybody copies examples. So the most important thing that we uh, should do is make lots of examples. And we particularly, the European Bioinformatics Institute has really moved forward on this uh, their uh, metagenomics uh, division now designs all their workflows as common workflow language workflow blocks, makes them and then implements them in various different systems. Uh, it means that they've enabled pi pipeline exchange amongst projects. They can compare the versions of the different workflows. They can recycle sub-workflows. They're building libraries. And that workflow library is now part of the standards, it's becoming part of the standards genomics consortium's activity. And NiPipes, those of you who use NiPipes, yeah, CWL is coming. Woohoo! How exciting. Anyway, well, I find it exciting because I'm a geek. Um, so, the last slide is what is fair? Um, what should be fair and how to implement it? I heard it a whole bunch of times this morning. And every time I hear that word, I go, oh, I wonder if they know what they meant. Right, because it's not simple. It is not good intentions. It means something very specific. All the stories that I hope I've told you are not technical ones. They're social ones. They're all to do with how do we get society, how do we get the community to work together in order to be able to use a small bit of technology in order to make things fair. But without incentives and cultural normalization and long-term investment, everything's just going to be a story anyway. And, uh, and I suggested, uh, or I suggest, that this kind of uh, roadmap that's been come up by the European Commission is actually might be a good roadmap for INCF because it kind of lays out what are the steps that you need to do? What are you going to be your incentives? How are you going to skill? What is your fair ecosystem? How will you build a fair culture? What is it actually you want to declare as your community what you believe to be something that can be measured as a fair assessment? And how do you want to measure it before some other guy comes along and says, aha, I've got the contract. 
to measure you because you don't want that. Okay, so that's uh, the, uh, the end of my, uh, my fairy talk. And I hope it actually gave you some um, uh, stimulation. I ought to mention the name at the bottom. That's Ian Cotton. Um, and uh, he's my husband. And the reason I put him in is because he, for the first time, in, we've been married 37 years now. He, he met, thank you. He met me when I was a child, honest. And... Uh, he, for the first time, he uh, came to, uh, over breakfast, he said, I've just been allocated to this, he's a research software engineer, to this neuroinformatics project. <laughs> wow. He said, and it's something to do with pipelines. And I said, oh, I do hope you're going to do a workflow pipeline. You know, do you know about night pipes? I said, oh, have a look at this. And, uh, and he came back to me and he said, my God, it's so bad. <laughs> this one. They, they're merging files with using eyeballing spreadsheets, right? I know I'm not going to tell you who the group is. Um, so let's be let's be, have a bit of reality here. While we're all kind of in this exciting world of beautiful uh, data archives and beautiful tools that I saw this morning and great talks that I'm going to hear later on, the majority of the community are struggling to write a bash script that actually is under version control and emerging their data files, files by eyeballing Excel spreadsheets. So let's just worry about that for a second. And then publishing papers. OK, thank you very much. Uh, so, of course, a wonderful talk, <laughs> Carol. Um, and, uh, it, you, you know, when you said, and you haven't gotten to evaluating resources yet, I was like, well, we actually deliberately did not do that. Yay! Because I felt that there was actually a mistake going on with FAIR in this headlong... Um, you know, emphasis on this technical validation when the communities who are referred to all the time in the FAIR standards had not yet come to grips with what that actually meant at a level at which they care about it. They care about file formats, they care about things that are in the laboratory, but a lot of people who talk about FAIR are talking about, you know, semantic graphs that sit on top of these public databases, and I think that's great. But when you talk to most neuroscientists, it's at the data level and at the operations in the laboratory, and that's where those people cannot help us. That's I, why I really, you know, I've been emphasizing that there's a community infrastructure that's required for FAIR, and that this work is hard, because this is where the scientists themselves have to come to some agreements. And that's why we decided to start on the community standards to say, where does neuroscience, do we even have any, right? And the good news was, yes, they're starting to come out in a form that possibly can be used, but we deliberately said, we're not going to do that yet, because we don't really even know how, because we haven't defined what FAIR means for neuroscience. Exactly, and, and of course I expected that, because uh, you are a wise woman, <laughs> and uh, one of the authors of FAIR, and one of the, uh, and so uh, I had a little Skype chat with uh, Mark Wilkinson, who's the uh, lead author of FAIR, doing a lot of the work, and I sent him Marianne's picture, and he said, whoa, they get it! I said, well, Marianne does, anyway. <laughs> and um, because because you're right, absolutely. And what worries me is that a lot of people, there are a lot of missionaries, there's a lot of fair missionaries out there, a lot of people who are fair wizards who will say, I can magic up your, uh, your data set to be fair and I can be contracted to do it and people believe them. Mm -hmm. And important people believe them, like funders, right, and journals and other places of fame and money. So this is why it's important that, to engage and to say, put your foot in the door. I spend a lot of my time in these RDA telcons putting my foot in the door saying no, but I'm beginning to feel a bit lonely. So, uh, so it's you're, really you're good. You're in the right place now. <laughs> <laughs> so, so it's really good that INCF as an organization say, this is what we are going to do, right? And, uh, and that's a powerful thing and really good. Yeah, you should, absolutely. Them. Yeah. Hi, Carol. Thank you for the wonderful and inspiring talk. Um, I wanted to, to ask a question about the T 
two, two pieces of things that you said. One is that you said, um, you know, it can't be about building better tools. FAIR is not about building better tools. That is absolutely correct. But then I want to ask the question, so you said, you know, we, got a prop, we have to mint and propagate identifiers, and I'm picking on that one because that's one of my hobbies and pastimes, but it's also one of the things that we um, have found to be, just at a practical level, one of the most difficult things to get anybody to do. Forget Bash scripts. I mean, it, this is a whole other level. Um, so my question is, do we have the tools to build a fair data ecosystem out of right now? Um, and, and if we don't have them right now, um, what do we need to do first? Oh, okay, that's a that's damn hard question. Luckily, we don't have time to answer that. No. <laughs> um, so, uh, um, yeah, absolutely. So people have been worrying about things like identifier creation and pro particularly propagation of identifiers through workflow systems, for example, for a long time. It's, all, it's really a research topic. Uh, and it hasn't even got to the development stage. It's still trying to figure out what that means. Um, so one of the things that uh, we... So, so this has to be done, I think, at the moment in practice. What, could we, what do we have to do in order to solve a particular problem? So we, so we don't try to do it philosophically. We do it from an engineering perspective. Uh, but I would say that because I'm an engineer. Um, and, uh, and then worry about, well, after we've done it over a series of different engineering examples, what's the principles that we can do it? So, Because at the moment, I would say there's a lot of work on principles and theory, but it doesn't ground out in practice. We're better off starting at doing some, some bespoke practice and then coming out of that and saying, well, what are the general principles that, the other way around? That's, my, that's how we're doing it in Elixir actually, uh, from, that, from that point of view. So we're grounding everything in our experiences in Nextflow and Galaxy and SnakeMake. And, you know, we've got about 15 workflow systems that we're using in Elixir routinely um, and uh, from different communities. And they all have different behaviors. Uh, and then we're trying to get that together in the common workflow language community. So, so I wanted to ask a follow-up to that, which is because I think that I, I, I would agree. Um, my question would be, how do we sustain the, not necessarily sustain the diversity, but sustain within the, the principle of FAIR, the idea that there won't be one. And, there, and so how do we prevent a single implementation, uh, right? This, yeah, from yeah, 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 yeah. trying to say, oh, implementations are FAIR. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, and this is why we, uh, and Marianne is part of this exercise. There is no one implementation. There's no one technology. Uh, there was already this has already this ship already sailed at one point. So, uh, there's a community, the the semantic web community, who declared that the only way to do fair was RDF. Now, I come from the semantic web community. I, you know, I founded the first journal of semantic web. No. Um, is not, you know, uh, that is not the, the only way. Uh, because this is uh, principles that we can then turn into practices and approaches which can then be ground out in specific technologies. Um, so, um, uh, so the only way we can do this is by building a diverse community that is implementing it in diverse ways. And to, to put our foot in the door, and INCF and Elixir are part of that foot in the door to say, there isn't one technology, and please don't believe people when they say there's only one way of doing it. Just like there isn't one workflow system, and there isn't one commons, and there isn't one database, and you want diversity. Diversity gives you strength. We're all trying to retain biodiversity because it gives us robustness. We have to, in an ecosystem of infrastructure and data, we need diversity in order to be able to retain robustness. <laughs> I don't know if it'll be brief. Um, it's, that's actually a good segue into my question. So you mentioned uh, some of your best friends are ontologists, but yeah. they don't really produce anything useful, right? I didn't quite say that. Uh, I want to go home and not be, you know, have rude things written on my front door. <laughs> so the reason I mentioned that is... Um, it's easy to start with something simple that's, so to say, practical to make progress. Yeah. But at the same time, that also uh, puts some serious issues under the rug. Right? What, what we have seen in the 
Alzheimer's and neuroimaging world is that people hurriedly produced a lot of garbage, to put it plainly, right? So is it not better to bear the brunt in the first mile, so to say, take all the pain and try at least get some, whatever we can agree upon standards, than just propagate garbage forward? So I, I was Where is to, the trade-off between... Yeah, like, there's a big trade-off, actually, yeah. to do with actually doing something practical, uh, but giving yourself a, um, a route. So what you, what you don't want to do is to paint yourself into a corner. Um, so in bioschemas, what we did was... Um, the, what happened was the ontologists... And, you know, I published about, uh, about 150 papers on ontologies, so just to put my hand up, say, I was that ontologist. It's like an AA meeting. Um, that um, uh, the ontologists got really interested in trying to describe the science in the paper, in the, in the resource, and that isn't what we were trying to do. We were trying to, to describe how you found it, because there were ontologies already in existence that described what the content was. What you wanted to be able to do is to say, this is the minimum, this is what a few things that we want in order to be able to navigate, and then you drop out into the very rich ontologies. But in the end, we had to introduce a few things like gene and protein and so on, because we needed it to work with the infrastructure, which is what his question was, right? As an engineer, if we said, ah, actually what we're going to do is have a property, which is this ontology term, you've just made it really hard to build a, a harvester. Yeah, and, you haven't, and that harvester is now hard to build if you're just an off-the-shelf JSON programmer, right? And, and that, so that killed it. That killed the ability to do it. So we had to make a compromise. So in bioschemas, we have mechanisms for you to be able to incorporate the ontologies that already exist and the ones that will come, but you don't break the principles that meant it became, it was actually bioschemas rather than something else. And that's what I meant. So it's kind of how do you build that roadmap? And that took two years to work out because we zigzagged. You know, we, we try to, you know, and we realize, hang on, we've gone down a rabbit hole here. We've now made it beautifully ont ontological and completely unprogrammable. Right. Carol, that was fantastic. Thank you so much. I really love the fact that you ended your talk on the training and education aspect as well. Yes. Because that's, uh, that, you know, if we want to get there, that's, that's definitely, you know, the, the, the work we have to do. And, uh, you know, with NCF, with uh, we're running with all those projects. Um, yeah.